Uh, welcome to the lecture series on the course transmission and distribution. This is Professor Umarao bringing you the lecture series under the ages of e sectional program of VTU e-learning center. So we are now starting the last module of the course on uh, transmission and uh, distribution. And uh, basically this uh, unit, this module deals with AC and DC distribution systems. And what are the radial feeders, parallel feeders, loop feeders, interconnected networks, and we will also be seeing secondary AC distribution systems, that is four wire, where it actually reaches the consumer and single phase two wire. And uh, what happens if you disconnect the neutral in a three phase four wire system? And we'll just be looking into the introduction on uh, reliability and quality of distribution uh, systems. How do we define reliability failure and little bit of how probability theory is applied in uh, assessment of reliability and uh, something introduction to power quality. So these are the topics to be covered in module five. Now, the distribution system, if you uh, realize is the last, last stage in the power network. That is, you have transmission, generation, transmission, and then finally distribution. So whatever is the power generator, how, how are we going to distribute it to the various customers? That is the um, aspect you'll be dealing with in distribution systems. So it, it acts as a channel between the distribution substations and the consumers. So the consumers could be residential, domestic, agricultural, industrial, commercial, so on. And uh, what are the main components of the distribution network? We have actually visited it in module one. Anyway, for continuity, let us see here. You have the distribution uh, uh, substation, right? Yeah, the distribution substation and uh, You have a primary distribution feeder and then distribution transformer. I'm sure all of us would have seen the distribution transformers on the roadsides and the distributors and finally the service mains, which is the actual connection between the system and the consumer at the consumer's premise. So the distribution, the voltage from the primary transmission level is stepped down to 33 kV to 132 kV. So that is where your primary distribution starts. Okay. So we saw that during transmission, you would have stepped up the voltage to 220 kV, 400 kV, very high voltages. So now we step it down from 132 to 33 kV. So industries may... Uh, evacuate the power at uh, around 66 kV or 33 kV and so on. And domestic consumers would normally uh, require the power at around 400 to 230 volts. So based on the country, we have different distribution uh, operating levels. Just see here, 6.6, 3.3 and uh, 2.2. Uh, kilovolts. So you have a wide variety of voltages. Now the power system operates at different voltage levels. And how, do, how does it operate at different levels? It is separated by transformers. We all know that. Right. So you have different transformers of different ratings. So if you look at India, whatever you have on your roadside, the transformers, you see they are normally 11 kV to 415 volts. 
So that is how they step down. And all these transformers, you see, they are normally three phase. Now we will see how uh, from three phase you get single phase and so on as we progress um, in the uh, unit. So the first component in the distribution system is the distribution substation. So here, what do the subs substations do? They step down the transmission voltages. So you might have a 132 kV substation, a 66 kV substation. So the voltage from the transmission level, maybe 400 kV or 220 kV will be reduced and stepped down. And it will deliver the energy from the substation. The energy will go directly to the industrial and residential consumers. So you just see here, you have some transmission level. Then you have here, what is shown here in red, this one. This is your distribution substation. And from the secondary transmission, which is called as the sub-transmission, it may go to other stations. So geographically apart, the power may be uh, distributed. And in your local distribution substation, it is stepped down. And then you have a number of feeders. And then each, you know, from the feeder, it will be connected to the loads and so on. So this is how it would look like. Now, if you look at this, I have added something here. Distributed generation. This is a new addition, recent. Okay. So here, we are including the generation on the distribution side. So what generation is it? This is mostly your solar, predominantly solar. Okay, because solar power can be generated at very low uh, uh, wattages also. So today the generation has actually entered the distribution. We call it as distributed generation. So this is the first stage in the distribution network. Next, we have the distribution feeders, the distribution feeders. So what is a feeder? A feeder is a conductor which connects the distribution. It is, see, it is connecting the distribution substation to the area where power is to be distributed. So from the substation to the area. So from your local substation to your area, you will have a feeder. Normally, tappings are not taken from the feeder. In between, you don't uh, take tappings. So your current will remain same throughout from the sending end to the receiving end. So the main parameter you look when you design a feeder is its current carrying capacity. Because the current is the same throughout. The design parameter is the current carrying capacity, which we call as the ampacity. It's the primary distribution line. Yeah. So these feeders, these conductors are called as feeders, distribution feeders. Then we have distributors. Here a line from which tapping are taken along its length for providing to the customer. So you would see from your local transformer, from your transformer, you'll have a conductor and, and they'll be tapped and given to your local poles, right? So you'll have a lot of tappings. That is what is a distributor. So that's the fine distinction between a distributor and a feeder. However, uh, often, uh, you know, these two terms are used uh, interchangeably and we just use the word distributor, okay? But bear in mind what, uh, what it is. So the, in the distributor, you have different types. Very popular is the radial distributor. So simple and cheapest. So you see radial. So this is the distributor and I have tappings to individual customers. So here I have shown a breaker. It could be a simple fuse too. If you take from your pole to your house, it will be a fuse. It may not be a breaker. So this is what we mean by tapping. So this is the distributor and then the power is tapped in between and given to individual customers. Very popular in residential and domestic connections. 
radial distributors. Then we have parallel distributors. So you know what is the meaning of parallel. So you see, this is my 66 kV bus. So 66 kV bus. So here I have two setups. So I'm reducing it maybe to 22, 11 or 6.6 .6 kV. So there is a transformer here and there is another transformer here. So the CB means circuit breaker. These are protective devices. Okay, so they isolate the part of the system in case of a fault, they will open. So circuit breakers, normally the contacts will be closed. And when there is a fault, the contacts will open. So you will study in your later course in switchgear how, how the breaker is designed. And we have a switch in between, a closure, reclosure. Okay. So what happens is, you know, I may be supplying power to the load. So you just see here if this is a load, I can supply the power through this or through this transformer or through this transformer. So supposing there is a fault here. So these are all two individual loads. Let us say there is a fault in this section here. There is a fault. Clear? Then what I can do is I open this switch and have supply only through this. Or if there is a fault in this section, this breaker would open. This breaker I will open and I will close this switch. So the load connected from here now can be served through this transformer. I can go like this. I hope you understood what we are, what we are trying to do here. It gives more reliability. See, under normal operating conditions, let us say I keep this switch open. So let me call, let us just take there are four loads. So one, two, three, and four, right? So when this switch is open, three and four are served by this transformer. So let me call this as T1 and this as T2, okay? So three and four are served through T2 and one and two loads are served through T1. Now let's say there's a fault uh, in T1, then immediately these breakers of T1 will open this transformer. Then immediately what I do, I close this switch, this switch S I close. So the moment I close the switch now, there's a path to one and two through this transformer. So this transformer will supply the power to three, four, one, two, all of them. So it will improve the reliability. Only thing is, of course, what is the question which should strike your mind? Is this transformer designed to take care of all the loads, right? So we should uh, see that. I'll present at the end of uh, uh, maybe this module, I'll present some interesting case studies uh, wherein you'll see how, uh, you know, even if you take all this reliability can be compromised. We will take an example and uh, see that. Clear? Yeah. So this is a parallel distributor. So obviously, it improves the reliability. Next, we have a ring main. A ring main is where the entire distributor is like a loop. So you start at one end and then you end back. It forms, uh, this is important, it forms a closed loop. And it can be fed at one or more points it's, that is called as a ring distributor. So such a distributor starts from one point, makes a loop through the entire area it is supposed to serve and returns to the original point. The primary advantage is that by proper choice, you can have greater economy in copper you can get by properly designing the distributor. So if it is fed through more than one source, it's called as a mesh system. So a mesh system is a ring main system where you have more than one source, where you have more than one source, okay? Obviously it will improve reliability because you're forming, you can give different loops. So see, this is another example. So if I start from here, if I start from one, let us say one and two, they terminate on this bus so I can travel 
Okay, I can go in a loop. And then I can come back. Here. Yeah. So you can see now why it's called as uh, as a ring mate. Why it's called as a ring mate. Okay. So it improves reliability because there are alternate paths to any load. Next, so we saw first the substation and then the feeder and distributor. These are the next components. And the third component is what we call as the service main. So the service main is the cable connected between the distributor and the consumer terminal. So from the pole, from the pole, you will see a wire comes to your house, your energy meter, where your energy consumption is recorded. That is your service mains. So you see, this is the distribution, the distributor, and from there, there is a wire which goes to the house. So this is called as the service main. Okay. So here you have a three phase, a secondary distributor and single phase or three phase also can be taken to the consumer. Clear? Yeah. So this figure drawn here, this uh, illustrates, let me choose a different color, illustrate whatever we saw. So this is the substation. So from the substation, there are two feeders. So you see, there are no tappings. There are no tappings. Then these are all distributors, A, B, B, C, C, D, A, D, A. These are all distributors. And each distributor you can see gives different consumers. And this is the service main. There are tappings here. Okay. That's why B, C, A, D, they're all distributors because you have intermittent tappings. And these conductors, they are called the service mains. So I think by now we are clear about the distinction between a feeder, a distributor, and a service main. Next, we have interconnectors. See, what happens in a ring main sometimes, uh, it may take a long route for the power to reach from the source to the destination. Clear. That depends on how you have the interclosing switches and all that. So supposing you are creating a ring main to supply a large area and there are many sections, then what happens each section, there will be a voltage drop and this drop can become significant and your voltage at the consumer terminal may be weak. So to compensate for such excessive uh, voltage drops, sometimes two different areas are joined by an interconnector. For example, here, if you see GD, GD is an interconnection. It's an interconnection. So such a conductor is called as an interconnector. So distant points in the ring main system can be connected. So you can have a shorter, see, for, for the power to go from G to D, if I don't have this interconnection, what is the way it will have to travel from G to F, F to E, and E to D? That is one path. Or G to A, A to B, B to C, C to B. This is another path. Or some part of the power may go via one and via two. That will depend on how the network is connected, where the sources are, impedances, so on and so forth. So now you see, I'm, I'm replacing this longer route by a shorter route here, GD. So obviously maximum power would be evacuated from that here. So that is an interconnect. Now, so we saw um, the key components of the distributor distribution system. And what are the requirements of a good distribution system? When we design a distribution system, what are the factors which we need to keep in the mind? The first one is, the system must be reliable. Reliability is the first criteria because you need to have continuous power supply. You need to have continuous power supply. And the system should comply to Indian grid code as stipulated by Central Electricity Regulatory Commission. This is in India. Since we're in India, I'm talking of India. Otherwise, 
it should comply to the grid code of the particular country and obey the regulation of that particular country. Now, a large country like US, there are different states. So each state may have its own regulation. So all these must be complied. Next, the light efficiency should be high. At least 90% or more. Next, you need to have proper protection without any leakage. When there is no leakage, my system should be able to be protected. So the proper choice of breaker ratings, the proper location of circuit breakers, all these must be done effectively so that when we isolate a fault, it is done properly. See, when we isolate faults, there are two things which we uh, look at. The first is called as selectivity and the second is sensitivity. So sensitivity means how good is your protection system to sense faults. That means I have a threshold above or below which I define a fault. So how sensitive is it to this threshold? That is sensitivity. Selectivity means isolation of the correct part of the network. That means if there is a fault, I must, I must isolate that part of the network which will be impacted by the fault. So I should not do nuisance tripping. That means areas which are not affected by the fault, this should not be tripped. And also I should trip areas which are impacted by the fault. If I don't do it, it will cause mal operation. Nuisance tripping is a nuisance, but mal operation may damage your equipment. Okay, both are undesirable. Both are undesirable. So that is what we have to take care when we design the protection system, and that's what is meant uh, when we make the statement that the system should ensure proper protection without any leakage. And the design of the layout should not influence the appearance of the site. Clear? Site means the area where you're going to locate it. The system must be cost effective. Okay, I will come with a fantastic system, very reliable, very good, everything, but it's prohibitively expensive. It doesn't serve the purpose. And operational management. So you see, we are not talking of one consumer, two consumers, hundreds and thousands of consumers. So your design of the distribution system should be such that the operational management is amenable for transparency. And the network topology must be kept simple. Otherwise, let us say there is no power in my house. I call the lineman. And he takes four or five hours to even find out where the fault is. Then it's a badly designed system. Clear. So at the end level, the last mile, the system should be simple for very effective fault diagnosis and operational management. Then safety is important because individual equipment failures may be there. In my house, my TV may burn out or, or there may be a problem. You know, my, suddenly I find that my com computer and all my uh, electronic equipment, um, they're gone for some reason. So in such cases, I must be able to uh, find out, you know, I must be able to see that I have given, in, given enough of safety. And uh, the distribution system should be adaptable and flexible because your load will not remain a constant. Clear, that is expansion. The load profile may change. I used, to, uh, people used to use incandescent bulbs. Suddenly they changed to fluorescent and now we use LED. And 15 years back, our electronic devices were minimal, but now everything is electronic. And worse, who predicted pandemic? So today, if you see my house, I have four, four laptops charging simultaneously, five mobiles ch ch charging simultaneously, and what all gadgets, people have smart watches which have to be charged. So you see the load profile is very dynamic, it keeps changing. So every time I change the load, I can't keep changing my distribution design, right? It has to be futuristic. So my distribution system 
must be adaptable to changing load conditions and changing operational conditions. See, recently there was a big uh, uh, blackout in Texas in the winter because of improperly designed distributed distribution system. They did not plan for such a severe winter and there was huge billions of dollars of loss. Clear? That is operational condition. We have to plan for all these things when we design the distribution system. And good quality of power supply. That means the consumer should get the kind of voltage they require. They want 230 volts, we need that. And then uh, sinusoidal. So these are all what are required. This, this means the quality of supply. The voltage should sag, sag means come down or go up. If the voltage is higher than what we want, then uh, it could lead to equipment damage. So I need good quality. Clear? So these are all some of the desirable features of a good distribution system. Let's, let's pass on to classification. How do I classify distribution systems? So whenever we classify anything, we need the parameter on which we classify. For example, if you want to classify human beings, you can do it on age. So young, middle age, old age, very old, geriatric, and uh, so on. You can do it based on the language they speak. Okay, Malayalis, Kannadigas, Teluguites, and so on. So some parameter, based on some parameter, we classify. So distribution system, similarly, if we look at the type of current, then you can classify the distribution systems into AC and DC. AC and DC distribution systems. And as we have discussed in module one, AC systems are widely adopted, right? Distribution of DC is limited. Uh, however, they're now becoming popular slowly because of solar, solar PVs, which generate DC, okay? So DC systems, distribution systems are viewed as an economical option because of generation of DC voltages using solar photovoltaic systems. Otherwise, DC became popular for transmission for long distances, about 600 kilometers. So now slowly on the distribution side, also DC is becoming popular. Then based on the construction, uh, we classify the distribution system broadly into overhead and underground systems. So overhead systems means where they run overhead above the land and underground is below, below the ground. So they're widely ad adopted and you've already done in module four, uh, I think about underground cables and what are their disadvantages, primarily the high charging current. So you can't run them for longer distances and so on. So overhead are still very popular all over the world and uh, underground systems are popular only where you know you are very concerned about aesthetics or where the right of way is very expensive. That means what you have to pay to run a distribution line. So if the right of way is very expensive, then we can go in for underground. Otherwise, overhead is still preferred. Then based on the type of connection, you can have a radial, parallel, ring main, interconnected mesh system uh, classification. And then you can have a classification based on the number of wires. So you can have two wire, which is DC or uh, single phase. You can have three wire AC, four wire distribution systems. Uh, normally three wire systems are preferred because uh, the cost will come down. And uh, you can adopt three wire systems for balanced loads and four wire systems Three phase four wire is preferred where you have both three phase loads and single phase loads. So the three phase loads can be fed from the uh, three lines, RYB, and the single phase loads will be fed between any of the lines and the neutral. Okay. So this is how we classify. Next, you have primary AC distribution and secondary distribution. So the Extra high tension transmission lines 
are used to transmit electrical power from generating stations. That is from 33 kV, you step up to 400 kV, right? And for primary distribution, these voltages are stepped down to 66 to 3.3 kV. So industries may take power from this um, primary distribution level. So they may evacuate the power at 6 to 6 kV, 33 kV, 11 kV, 6.6 kV, 3.3 kV, and so on. Next, this is this will is much greater than what we need at domestic level. 230, 415, 400, 440, those, that, that voltage. So the primary distributions, they're called as feeders. So you don't take tapping in between. An industry requires a voltage at 66 kV. There will be one feeder running from the substation to the industry. I won't tap in between. Okay. Then for a load requirement for 5 MBA, 5 MBA or less, we can have a secondary distribution, transfer, secondary distribution system where we use distributors. So what's the difference between the distributor and the feeder? The distributor will have tappings in between, tappings in between. So you see, there is no, I can't draw a line and say, at this voltage, it will be a feeder, at this voltage, it will be a distributor. Just understand the broad concept of primary distribution, secondary distribution, of a distributor, a feeder, tapping in between and tapping not taken. Clear? Yeah. So the primary distribution system primarily consists of feeders that deliver power from distribution substations to distribution transformers. Right, like I told you, an industry wants 66, uh, at 66 kV, so they will have a transformer on their premise. So from the substation to the industry, there will be a feeder running. There might be a feeder running from your local substation to, to, to the transformer your transformer. And from this transformer, I may uh, supply, deliver power to around 100 residential houses. Yeah. So we already saw a feeder is a conductor which connects the substation to the area where the power is to be distributed. And generally no tappings are taken. So the current remains unchanged. So you just see here, just uh, let us just uh, uh, see this connection. Yes. So this is the grid from the grid, right? Then we have a substation. So maybe 33 kV or 11 kV will be there. So now I have 11 kV cable and there is an industry which is taking the power at 11 kV and we have included distributed generation here. So this wind power is again interconnected at 11 kV. Then you see there's a small town here and from here you may have distributors going on to different offices and apartments and so on. And uh, again, I may step down this 11 kV to 415 volts. This is a step down transformer. And from here I can give to small houses, res residential houses. Okay, so this is how um, uh, it is uh, done. And uh, here you see, I have a pole mount. Everything is shown here different. Here I have a pole mounted transformer. And normally pole mounted transformers will reduce the voltage to around 415 volts. And from there I supply individual houses, right? And here, you know, I have 11 kV. Then now I have underground cable here. This is an underground cable. And under using underground cables, we supply the houses. So any of these, all these form the distribution system. So this figure is very good. It shows a number of things we have discussed in one figure. Now, let's see radial figures. I have already shown this figure. So feeder, this is a feeder. This is radial. It's actually a distributor because there are tap tappings. And I told you the word distributor and feeders are interchangeably used. So the moment you have tappings like this, it, it actually is a distributor. Okay, so this is a radial distributor, but in literature, it's called as a radial feeder. Without any uh, tappings in between is actually a feeder, but this is also called as a radial feeder. So each customer can be connected to a single feeder. Since there are no feeder interconnections, a fault will, see, supposing a fault occurs here, right? then all the load will be 
everything will be disconnected. If I isolate this, if this breaker opens, everything will be disconnected. So that is the drawback of a radial feeder. So you see some more radial feeders are given. These are called as laterals. So you see, this is, this is a radial feeder and this is a lateral, main feeder lateral. And then from here, it is connected to different loads, different loads. There is another lateral feeder here and it goes to another different set of loads, right? And here I have a radial distributor. So this is your uh, mid voltage transformer, okay? Then from this feeder, I have individual transformers and each of them are supplying different loads. So you see, this is all, this is the meaning of radial. This is the radial feeder. See, supposing a fault occurs here. My source is here. This is the source. Okay. This is the source. Right? So let us say this is section one, two, three. So supposing a fault occurs here. Right? Now the breaker here will open. The breaker here will open. Right. So what will happen from the source, section one will be served, but section two and three will be disconnected because when this opens, this is radial. Na? So the power to three has to come to two. There is no other path for power to reach section three. It has to go through two. So therefore, if there's a fault in two, that's what we meant when we told earlier in radial feeders, downstream customers will get affected. Upstream, it's fine because I can isolate this section. So from the source, it can go here but two and three will get disconnected. Supposing there's a section, there was a fault in section one, then one, two, three, all of them will get disconnected. Okay, so this is the drawback with radial connections. So what are the advantages? It is very simple and uh, hence cost effective. And uh, heavy industrial loads will require radial feeders from the substation directly one feeder to, to the industry, okay? And isolated loads and areas also used. So I have one small village. So I will use a radial feeder, a radial feeder to the village. Disadvantages are poor reliability because, you know, if there is a fault, many customers can get isolated. And uh, if you have more and more loads, geographical area is more, you may have to lengthen the feeder length. And you just see here, look at the, let us look at the previous page here. If you just, uh, let me, uh, yeah. So let us say the voltage here is V source, right? And the voltage here at V1, section one node would be Vs minus the drop in this section. Now at two, it would be V1 minus the drop in this section. And at three, it would be V2 minus the drop in this section, right? So you see, as we go away from the source, as we go away from the source, my voltage drop will be higher and higher. So the voltage will go on dropping. So if it's a long radial feeder, then the voltage at the end, this is what is meant. The consumers at the distant end of the distributor would be subject to serious voltage fluctuations when the load changes. And they may have, you know, a lot of voltage drop. So this is one disadvantage of the major disadvantage of the radial feeder, parallel feeder. Now look at this figure and then we'll read the story. So you see, this is my source. This is my source. And there are two feeders here, right? and uh, supplying two loads. Let us say each load is 10 kilowatts or let us say 100 kilowatt. 10 is too less for an area, 100 kilowatts. So let us assume these, these feeders are identical. So under normal operating conditions, this will take 100 and this will also take 100. 100 and 100. This is the normal case. Now, supposing there is a fault in this feeder. Now this feeder will open, these breakers will open. Clear? 
So now what will happen? 200 will flow here. So I should design this to carry 200. That's there. So I'm, it'll split here and 100, 100 will get distributed. So my load is unaffected. The you know, because there is a parallel path. So reliability is improved by using parallel feeders. Two or more radial feeders starting from the same or different substations will run in parallel. So equal load sharing amongst all the feeders is possible if they are identical. Otherwise, they will share in inverse proportional of the in impedances of the two feeders. So the, power, the system has greater re reliability and as it is capable of supplying the total load even in case of faults. It is expensive, obviously, because I need two lines instead of one, right? Now I need two 200 kilowatt lines instead of one 200 kilowatt lines. So if I had only one line, then if there's a fault there, all the customers will be cut. But if I have one more line, even if there's a fault on one line, the other line can take everything quality. Quality and reliability always costs money. I keep making that statement. You cannot have quality without paying for it. You have to pay for it. You can't have reliability without paying for it. You need to pay for it. So that's what it is. So you see, this is another example. So again, this is parallel. We saw this earlier also, right? So in the normal case, I can open this connection and supply half the load from here and half the load from here. But if there is a fault anywhere, I can close this and I can supply power entirely from this. Yeah. The only thing you should see here is this transformer. See, in the normal case, each may be carrying 100, 100, as I told you. Right, 100, 100. But if, if I close this and open this because there's a fault here, then this should carry 200. So I must design properly whenever we have parallel feeders, right? Otherwise, you may, there might be a path, but then the line, the transformers may not be designed for it because of which the protective device here, if you don't, if this is not a hundred, uh, if this is, this is not capable of taking 200 uh, kilowatts or megawatts or whatever is the unit, then these breakers will open, right? So I have a path agreed. But then the path will also get disconnected because I have not chosen proper ratings. Clear? Yeah? So whenever you have a parallel feeder, it's not just enough. You put a feeder, you should design it properly. Clear? Yeah. And I should, I should keep in mind the fact that in the event of a fault, one of them may have to take the entire load. So in such case, yes, the reliability will definitely be improved. Here, yeah. so in this session, we saw the introduction to distribution systems. What is the difference between a feeder, a distributor, and a service main? And we saw parallel feeders and radial feeders. Thank you.